subscribe to our youtube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates and a very warm welcome to all of you to this special lecture by eminent chinese scholar prof yan shuo tong on the subject of implications of china us competition in the digital era we have the print as a media partner for the event which is also being live streamed on our youtube channel let me extend a very warm and personal welcome to a speaker my old friend dr yan shuo tong who is well known to many of you here dr yan is a distinguished professor and dean of the institute of international relations of tsinghua university peking he is also secretary general of the world peace forum an influential platform on international relations as you are aware dr yan yan is one of china's leading thinkers on foreign policy and strategic issues his writings are impactful and are followed closely in china and internationally welcome prof yan thank you yeah. thank you ambassador kant <laughs> well, welcome uh, we are delighted the dr yan will be speaking today on a critical issue which is still taking shape the china us rivalry in the digital age prof yan has written on this subject and argued that the sino us bipolar competition will be fundamentally different from the us soviet bipolarity during the cold war ideology is no longer the main engine driving the international contestation emerging between the two most influential countries in the world as was the case during the cold war now the digital dimension of strategic competition is shaping up as the primary arena for rivalry between the usa and china as shuo tong will spell out what he believes is that bipolar competition will intensify in the digital age Shui Tong will speak for about 30 35 minutes and has kindly agreed to take questions after that you may indicate your interest in asking questions by using the raise hand option questions can also be sent to me through the chat option i will call on participants to ask their questions the concerned participants will be unmuted other participants are requested to keep themselves muted i'll not mind by dr yan shuo tong to deliver his lecture over to dr yan thank you ambassador kent for this uh, very valuable opportunity you organized for me to uh, share my view uh, with this uh, distinguished uh, uh, guests we have uh, so many and uh, uh, senior diplomats and also i'm uh, very uh, grateful and uh, mr mainan also attended today's uh, uh, discussion well uh, just now and uh, mr uh, ambassador kent has a uh, uh, gave a brief introduction about uh, what i'm uh, 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 talking about today and uh, i think i just make a, a few points and the first first point is uh, talking about the differences between china us competition and uh, soviet union us rivalry during cold war and nowadays you heard that many people talking about the new cold war and so the new cold war actually means uh, many many people and believe and this time we just uh, return to the cold war and uh, will experience the same thing between two uh, competition same competition between two superpowers actually in the history the rivalry or competition between the great powers is a, a, a common phenomenon it's not rare it's always happened in history but some not always but these uh, competition not the same in content the the rivalry and uh, in nature or in character and the rivalry is same but in content and the form uh, form of this competition will be different right so just like uh, when we say cold war immediately we think about the the uh, soviet union and the us and but uh, when we're talking about the world war 2 immediately we think about the war between the US, uh, us and uh, uh and the germany and when we're talking about the world war 1 then we can say okay this a uh, european uh, uh colonial powers so you see each time the players are not exactly the same second the main strategy adopted or used for competition are very different so now for my first upon that how different the competition between china and the us will 
will be different from that between US and the Soviet Union. First, we must uh, have a clear definition or common definition for a Cold War. Only we know what is a Cold War, and then we can make the judgment whether we are going to have a new Cold War. Cold War is a military uh, competition, mainly military competition between Soviet Union and the U.S. and uh, by what? By ideological purpose and uh, through the proxy war to expand their ideology, political system globally. So it's a very simple for uh, both U.S. and the Soviet Union, they, they concern only through the proxy war, it's uh, possible to control a local government in that country and uh, force that, that government to adopt the same ideology and political system. So if a more country adopt the same ideology and the political system with one of them, and that superpower would believe he can win the competition. So this is a Cold War. And uh, because the driven force is ideology, and because at that time, there's a nuclear the weapons are already uh, 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 processed by uh, major powers. They know they cannot go to direct war like the World War II and World War I. So then what kind of war they, they go? They went to a lot of uh, proxy war, like the Sixth War in the Middle East, the war between uh, 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 the uh, many wars in the Africa and the Latin America. And even there's a lot of uh, uh, many times, uh, many uh, several times of a war between uh, India and uh, Pakistan. So then China also involved in Korea War and the uh, 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 Vietnam War. So you see, when we use the term talking about a Cold War, it just means a, a kind of a type of war. If there's no war, we do not have the Cold War. So this is uh, my definition. Make, uh, to summarize the definition is that a uh, uh, proxy war driven by ideological purpose uh, be, uh, of the two superpowers. Now, how about today? Today, the competition between China and the US are same like that between US and the Soviet Union in nature or in character but they're very different in form and the content. First, let's talk about the content. And uh, by no means, Trump wants to advance Americans' ideology in the world. The reason is uh, very simple, because Trump himself and his people, I mean, in the White House, they are, rep uh, they are representative of uh, anti uh, 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 the establishmentism. That means uh, their ideology opposite from uh, liberalism. So there are group people dislike liberalism. They have no any motivation to advance the liberalism in the world. They have no any interest to protect liberalism in the world because they oppose liberalism. Meanwhile, they, they know they do not want to advance anti-establishment in the world because they know it's not welcome by most of the country. Okay, for China, and from the July, uh, 7th, uh, July 7th of this month, Chinese government frequently re, uh, uh, reiterated that China do not want to have a ideological confrontation with, against the United States. Even US purposely tried to provoke a ideological confrontation, China said, no, I don't want to do it. You just do it by yourself. Okay, so what will happen? American Trump administration use ideology as an instrument against China. And for China said, okay, well, I have no interest to have an ideological confrontation with you. So ideology is not the goal. It's not the, the purpose of uh, China or US foreign policy. They do not develop the policies, foreign policies for the sake of ideology. Now, this is totally different from the Cold War. Second, and the, during the Cold War, if you, the, the US and Soviet, they, they had to 
uh, adopt the proxy war strategy to advance their ideology and the political system. But now, neither China and the U.S. and prefer to adopt the proxy war. U.S. even want to get the troops out of the Middle East. Trump has decided to deduct 2,000 troops from the Iraq, another 2,000 troops from the Afghanistan. He will get the 4,000 troops back home, and then he will reduce further. And uh, Trump has no any interest to go to the proxy war. And uh, he is the president. If we, should, we cannot use the term peaceful, at least the fact he is the only American president didn't initiate any war after the Cold War since 1992. Uh, and uh, what, I, what I mean, I mean, uh, at the American side, they already abandoned the traditional strategy, so-called the proxy war. For China, China has not involved any war, including proxy war, since 19, after 1979. In the future, I don't know, I cannot say very long, at least uh, within the next uh, 10 years, I don't think China prepared or want to initiate any proxy, proxy war against the U.S. So if neither China nor the U.S. want to go to the proxy war or adopt the strategy of proxy war for advancing their interests, I don't think that there will be a lot of a proxy war will happen. So ideology is not the goal of their strategy. And the proxy war is not the uh, methods uh, for achieving their interests. And then the third uh, uh, differences between the, uh, 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 between China U.S. competition um, uh, from uh, uh, that between U.S. and Soviet Union is what is that uh, this is a digital ideology. So in content, China and the U.S. compete for what for digital superiority. Why they compete for digital superiority? Because in this age, the digital technology is the resources of national wealth. Digital technology means national security. The cyber security is already become the major part of national security. It's more important than any other national security issues. So in the digital age, and the, both China and the U.S. compete, uh, 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 compete each other for what? For having digital super, uh, uh, superiority over the other side, right? That's why the U.S. adopt the technology decoupling policy, try to slow down China's uh, tech, uh, techn uh, techn uh, technological invention. Well, in this, why they have they heavily uh, 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 they, uh, they concern they adopt a strategy with a, a digital mentality. First, they will ask the question, hey, wait a minute, how can we have a more wealth, accumulate a more uh, wealth faster than the other side? Then they find that uh, US, Germany, Japan, South Korea, and uh, 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 France, and uh, all of these uh, major Industrialize the countries. The already their digital economy has already accounted for over fifty percent of their GDP. Over fifty percent. What do I mean? They mean they know that the share of the uh, digital economy in their GDP will become the larger and the larger. So that's why recently and the. Macron, the French president said, we are the lag behind the China and the US. The Europe will have to concern our digital technology invention. Otherwise, and we'll be lag, uh, uh, lag behind the further and the further. This is, uh, so in the future, no matter China or the US, they cannot become the richer by controlling the natural resources in the world. It's not how much oil you control. No, it's not how much minerals you control. It's not how much sea water you control. 
You can control all of these, but you cannot become the richer quick enough. You cannot become the richer than the other side. Because uh, these things, these uh, traditional resources can no longer generate the wealth as a faster, as more as a digital technology. In the last 15 years, digital, uh, digital economy grow at, the, the, no, I'm sorry, the growth rate of the digital economy is a 2.5 2 times of the general GDP of the whole world. So that means the globally, the whole world, the share of the digital economy of the whole world wealth will become larger and larger. This is a general trend. And when it will stop, I don't know. But one thing is clear, the non-digital economy and non-digital economy will continue to grow, in, but because they grow slower than digital economy, so the share of the non-digital economy will shrinking, will become smaller and smaller. So human beings are so selfish, they will heavily give a, a focus, their attention on what? On wealth and on the wealth which can generate a faster and uh, 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 than the uh, uh, other business. This is uh, one reason. Second, I think it is more important than the wealth. It's about the security. And uh, now you look at uh, current situation. And China and the US do not go to proxy war. But then you will see the cyber war have been carried out every day. And uh, the uh, uh, the fire at the uh, nuclear uh, uh, what the nuclear uh, uh, site in the Iran. Actually, there's a more and more reported uh, if it was caused by the uh, a cyber attack from either the Israel or from the United States. And at least uh, last time and a, year, a few years ago, and the nuclear lab was totally destroyed by what? By the virus. And that is clear that the American use of virus and, uh, uh, destroyed the Iran's uh, nuclear facilities. And the US also used the, uh, uh, through the uh, cyber, uh, uh, with their cyber uh, technology and uh, this, uh, and, uh, 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 attacked the uh, Venerilla's uh, power station. So caused the, uh, 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 no power for three days uh, in that country. So nowadays you find that national security so closely related to your cyber security. And uh, they can attack you without sending troops, without bombing the city, without bombing anything, without the military occupation. So they can attack a country through the internet. So that's why all the countries concerned that, hey, my cybersecurity is the number one uh, 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 issue or the should the, the government give the uh, most, uh, uh, the, the first uh, priority to cybersecurity. So this is a, a, a content and the further competition between China and the United States, okay. So the first is uh, now the Cold War. The second is uh, because we're in the, a uh, uh, digital uh, age. And the third, uh, third point is that because China and the US compete for the digital uh, uh, superiority in the world, and then what a strategy they will adopt to win the competition? My understanding, the, the first, they all understand that the digital superiority is based on technology invention. Technology invention is based on what? Based on the engineers, scientists. Well, my understanding, the competition is what? Focus on who can have a more engineers and uh, scientists because of all the inventions based on the human, human's brain. And the capital certainly is, is important. You cannot do the research without capital. So there's a, there's two countries we invest, invent more and more capital in the research. But 
when both sides invent the same money on the research, it depends on who have a larger team of scientists and engineers, who has a more qualified, higher qualified engineers and scientists. So these two things, and based on what? Based on education and the policy to recruit the global international uh, uh, talents. So from my understanding nowadays, uh, these two countries uh, already started. For instance, US adopted a decoupling policy. What is that? They said, okay, we should stop Chinese to learn the uh, uh, scientific knowledge in the US and then bring them back to uh, do the scientific invention, right? That, that's very, very typical, uh, 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 important uh, strategy. And uh, also the constraint control that uh, we cannot uh, sell this uh, high tax to China, the same. And then you find that China, uh, lot, uh, I think the week, uh, two weeks uh, ago, and China issued a uh, new uh, uh, regulation and forbidding sell and uh, uh, some certain technology to uh, uh, foreign companies. And there's a, a list uh, for the 28 fields. So this is, a, this is a nothing secret. All of the things are reported by the media in the public and uh, all the government have uh, uh, issued uh, issue these documents and say that uh, that's our policy. So my understanding in the future, this competition will be intensified between these two countries, right? So they, they know that the question is not how much, how much you control the land, the water or the mountain or the resources. No, it's not control that. Control what? How much you can control the a uh, uh, website, how much you can show the uh, internet. This is a, 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 a competition. Okay, so then this kind of competition at least, uh, at least looks not, not that violent. The cyber war, generally speaking, do not cause very much death, not cause, cause much casualty, like the proxy war. Now, many people killed in the proxy war, but on the cyber war, well, maybe coincidentally, some people, uh, individuals uh, uh, died because of it, but very, very limited, not like the real war. This is a very, uh, very difficult. So it looks very peaceful. Right? You cannot uh, hear the uh, bomb, you cannot uh, see the people uh, die. And uh, meanwhile, they come to also in the security and the market, then they will ask a question. Okay, since the digital economy generated more wealth for these two countries, they will ask a question, hey, where we can generate the money and from, where, uh, uh, from the market? Then the largest digital market is East Asia. I mean, the largest uh, 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 economy of the uh, uh, digit, uh, uh, large, largest market of the digital economy. China and uh, Japan and uh, North Korea already have a quite large size of the digital economy. And uh, this uh, uh, pandemic and uh, undermined the economy of all sectors. But the online business, from my understanding, is actually getting, is a boom. And you find that, and uh, the first, uh, uh, the first uh, 10 and the largest uh, 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 company on the, uh, uh, mark, uh, on the stock market at the New York, eight of them are digital economy. Only two of them are non-digital economy. So in the future, the digital company will become a big economic player and they generate the wealth. Well, when this uh, digital economy controls so much wealth, both China and the US, the government, I mean, they will be very cautious with the, uh, the company. They will consider, hey, wait a minute, when they are too powerful and they do something, 
may undermine the government power, right? So you see, nowadays uh, Trump want to decoupling Chinese company and uh, try to uh, uh, false Chinese TikTok company to sell it to American, uh, uh, American company. And meanwhile, Trump said, okay, you cannot uh, reach a deal by yourself. That means uh, Chinese company, uh, American company, you cannot reach a deal by yourself. Trump said that the government will involve in it. We make the decision. How do you do the deal? So that means Trump do not only trust the Chinese company, Trump do not even trust the American digital company. They said, we cannot let you have, have too much power. Right? Well, well, because of East Asia, and at least at this moment, the digital economy in East Asia is already larger than the Europe. And so US and China will definitely will compete for this market. So East Asia will be the market and the major market and the, uh, uh, of the competition between China and the US. And uh, that's the, so the last point I, I want to make. And is that uh, because China and the US compete on, uh, uh, for the digital economy and the cybersecurity, how about the other countries? This time, my understanding, the other countries uh, will not adopt the alliance strategy uh, usually used by the other countries during the Cold War. They will adopt the hygiene strategy. And uh, 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 actually uh, initiated by the Singapore. And uh, by 2012, uh, Singapore is the very first country and invented the concept and the hiding strategy. That means, uh, and uh, take sides with China on economic issues. Meanwhile, taking sides with US on security issues. So with all of these uh, countries facing the pressure from the China and the US competition for taking sides. And uh, my understanding, most countries said, wait a minute, I will not repeat it, what we did during the Cold War. We will adopt a new strategy to dealing with the competition between China and the US. Even the Japan, Germany, they do the same. Japan also taking sides with China on economic cooperation and uh, 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 meanwhile cooperate with the US for the security protection. So now this kind of a hedging strategy becomes a more sophisticated. It's not so simple, divided by the issue, divided by economic issue or security issue. No, even in economic issue, and the country said, wait a minute. And uh, in terms of free trade, I take sides with China. In terms of uh, take a, a, a reform of the WTO, they said we will uh, stand with the US and to force China to abandon its uh, 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 status of uh, development countries. And in terms of the anti-COVID-19 campaign, countries also take a hedging strategy. In terms of, in terms of international cooperation and against the anti-control the virus, they said we take sides with China. But in terms of about the origin, and searching, seeking the origin of this uh, uh, virus. So we take sides with the US. Nowadays, uh, these things have become more and more sophisticated. And uh, the countries have become more and more clever. And then they said, okay, since this strategy is very useful to dealing with the, uh, China and the US, so more and more countries uh, adopt this. Well, what does it mean? It means that the world will not only shape by the competition between China and the US. The world will be shaped simultaneously also by those hiding strategies adopted by the other countries. When so many country, country all adopt, most of the country adopt the hiding strategy. This strategy plays a role to shaping the world. That's why, and we find that 
this is not is not the world we are familiar with the Cold War. It's different, and you cannot use the Cold War to make the judgment that oh, who who is the side with the U.S. and uh, 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 with the Soviet Union, and then you find well, every country seems to me is hiding between the two countries rather than take side with uh, one country only. Certainly, Iran cannot take a hiding strategy, and the Russia cannot adapt. Uh, uh, adopt a hiding strategy. It's because those countries have no other choice. And certainly also some countries cannot take sides with China, like those countries have no formal diplomatic relationship with China. They do not adopt a uh, hiding strategy. But those countries cannot adopt a hiding strategy are in small group, uh, a small number, less than 20. Most of the country, we have a, UN have the 194 members, and uh, now we have uh, uh, over 200 political entities. So more, it's about 180 countries and adopted the hiding strategy. So the hiding strategy actually is shaping the world. It's make this world becomes more complicated. That's why uh, many people do not agree with me. They, <laughs> they think they still believe and we are moving toward the 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 the, the cold, uh, uh, new cold war is the, uh, because they say this is a complicated but they say they think they say, but uh, it's the same in nature uh, with the cold war uh, that's the reason finally i want to wrap up and uh, the final is that uh, how about china and the us dealing with a hiding strategy adopted by the others my understanding and the both sides will concern okay uh, both sides will uh, give the priority to bilateral diplomacy. And uh, because the uh, globalization already uh, stopped, and, and, uh, becomes a very slow, I cannot say stop, it's a, a slowdown. The anti-globalization is a, a gaining momentum. So multi Multilateral diplomacy be, becomes uh, um, uh, less effective than before. And there's a, especially when there's no global leadership, the multilateral, multilateral diplomacy becomes uh, less and less useful. Now you find that uh, most of the multilateral uh, uh, summit and uh, held on what? By uh, like uh, uh, online. But the bilaterally, the still in person. Then you, if you observe this, you know, okay, the people said we want to spend energy, money, resources on bilateral diplomacy. On multilateral diplomacy, okay, they still say, okay, we support this, <laughs> but we think we can do the webinar, just a talk, okay. <laughs> we do not need to talk privately and meet in person. They don't want to spend money, energy on it. So both China and US will give the priority to what? To bilateral diplomacy. Actually, it's not, this is not a good or bad, is that if they want to solve the problem in this special situation, they have to. They find that the bilateral diplomacy can settle down these people, can solve the real problem. Multilateral diplomacy, it sounds it's politically correct, but it cannot help these two countries to solve the problems. So in the future, I, I guess both China and the U.S. and the will give a, a, a will give a more attention on bilateral relations. And finally, I want to talk uh, very little. And the China-Indian relationship will be the same. And this is a mainly a bilateral issue. And I don't think. And China and the US, uh, China and the Indian can find any multilateral platform to settle down disputes between us. And uh, our problem and, uh, uh, can be solved only on this uh, bilateral diplomatic uh, 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 for, uh, format or the um, uh, platform. Well, Ambassador uh, Kent, and uh, that's my uh, presentation. Is that okay? Oh, that's, that's brilliant, uh, Professor Yan. Uh, thank, thank you, you thank very you. much for that. You know.
and perceptive presentation are full of insights into nature of uh, the rivalry between the USA and China. You know, Professor Yan Shethong uh, brought out that uh, uh, China-US contestation today is strategic in character, it's intense and intensifying. It's very different from the Cold War that obtained between the US and the erstwhile Soviet Union. Uh, US rivalry is not about ideology. Uh, it's not proxy war involving third countries. Uh, it's not about quest for natural resources. Uh, it's instead uh, competition for data superiority in a digital age, as Professor Yan Shothung brought out. In fact, he seemed to suggest that there's a sort of war which is unfolding between China and the USA. And in this contestation, the national security will be closely aligned to quest for cyber security, which will become very important. Uh, and other countries uh, will adopt, according to Professor Yan Shethong, uh, a hedging strategy uh, with regard to the United States. Other country, uh, they will hedge. Uh, that will be the approach. And China and the USA both uh, will give precedence to bilateralism while trying to find solution to problems rather than adopting a multilateral approach. Uh, he, of course, and I'm not trying to sum up his remarks, uh, his remarks were rich in content and ideas, and I'm sure there'll be a whole lot of questions in discussion that will follow. Uh, so let me open the floor for discussions now. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you can ask your question by raising your hand using the raise hand option, or you can just indicate in the chat box uh, your desire to ask question, and I'll, I'll invite you to ask question. I'll begin with uh, Ms. Jyoti Malhotra, uh, National Strategic Affairs Editor of the Print, our media partner for this event. First set of questions will be asked by Jyoti. Over to you, Jyoti. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Kanta. Uh, Professor Yan, thank you so much for your remarks. Uh, it was, they were very, very interesting. I'm a journalist here in Delhi, and uh, it's a pleasure to, to hear you. My question, unfortunately, is not about uh, US-China, because I look at uh, India's foreign policy from the Indian point of view. So I have a question on the uh, crisis between India and China. You know that the Chinese um, PLA troops have occupied Indian territory uh, in the Ladakh sector. So my question is, first of all, do you hear about this at all in your country? Do you know that there is a conflict between India and China on India's borders? What is the conversation inside China about this? And last of all, why have the Chinese, why has the Chinese government, uh, your president Xi Jinping is also the head of the military commission, why are you uh, aggressing into India's territory and um, occupying Indian territory? Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for your questions. And uh, I think uh, uh, you uh, have a very clear uh, 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 stance that you read these questions from the Indians' uh, perspective. That means the Indians' view. Well, in China, you can hear a lot of discussions, a lot of reports, and many informations about the border conflicts or the military uh, uh, conflicts between uh, uh, China and the U.S., just like what and uh, opposite, mirror, just a mirror, ma uh, 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 mirror uh, image in China. And they're talking about how the Indian occupy uh, China's uh, territory, uh, how India initiated this military attack, and how the Indian troops uh, and caused these troubles, and also the question why the Indian and uh, we do so much business in India, but the Indian to try to kick out this uh, border disputes with us, and why Indian simultaneously like, and uh, forbidden uh, uh, China's apps. Well, the view just uh, in China, you can hear the ordinary people talk just like you. And from the Indian side, they're from Chinese side. So then my, if you ask me uh, the question, I will say that, okay, when two countries, the people, just uh, able, both sides believe and that they are being, uh, they are being uh, 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 taken advantage by the other side. They are being uh, bullied by the other side. They, so do you think uh, we can solve the problem? 
And my understanding, only when both sides concern that, okay, I take the third person position and look at this issue from the, from the third, uh, third, uh, third party's stance. Say, okay, there's a problem in two countries. And then if you sit down to talk about this issue and looking for solutions rather than to try to uh, finger point at the other side and otherwise you cannot solve the problem. So for my understanding, at this moment, it seemed to me, at least the people in both countries enjoy point a finger at the other side. And people enjoy condemn the other side because they say, hey, that's feel is so enjoyable when I said that they're the other side are doing something wrong. But actually they forget that point a finger at the other side is never the way to solve any problem. May, may I ask another question, Ambassador? Please, please go ahead, yeah. Um, Professor Yan, uh, so are you suggesting therefore that, that there should be a third party, a third country that can perhaps broker um, <laughs> a resolution between India and China at this point? And who in your view could such a third party be? Well, I don't think any country has that power or have that capability to solve the problem between two countries have a 1.4 billion population. And uh, if God come to the earth, maybe the God can do it. <laughs> well, I don't think anyone beyond God can solve the problem. We can, we can only rely on our both sides, bilateral efforts, bilateral diplomacy. So from my understanding, if anyone think, hey, maybe we can rely on the third party solve the problem, my understanding, that cannot achieve any result. Because these two guys are so huge. How can you get any country to solve the problem between China and India? I don't think so. Just like if, if someone asks me, do, you think, do we think anyone can stand out to solve the problem between China and the US? I said, no. Yes, no. <laughs> no, any country can solve this problem. Right. And, but you know, Professor Yan, that the Indian side has been asking the Chinese uh, several times to sit down and exchange maps along this entire sector, but the Chinese have refused to do so for many, many years. They don't even want to exchange maps. So how are we going to even know what the other thinks? Well, actually, at my side, we heard a story just the opposite. That's the Indian reject. Indian refused to talk. <laughs> so you know, the, this kind of, when the, when the two governments and the, do not sit together, you let the people and uh, to discuss the issue based on the media, the news, I don't think we, we can make any positive result. Generally speaking, my understanding, most of this news uh, on, the, uh, on the phones uh, through this uh, social, uh, what, uh, social media, and uh, just uh, uh, the, 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 this information is far from reality and uh, the twist of the reality. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your comments. Thank you. Uh, may I now invite Ambassador Vijay Nambiar? He has a question. Thank you. Uh, I think I, my question is that what kind of international coalition does China expect to build, both in terms of norm setting? Because I think uh, uh, Professor Yen Shetung has talked about in his in, of, of that there should be leadership in norm setting. Uh, mm -hmm. would, would there be any norms so that controlling the digital economy and who's to take leadership of those norms? And what kind of international coalition does China expect to build to take control in this global competition for the digital economy? Especially when you say that there are so many countries which will be doing the hedging. What kind mm. of well, how, how do you expect to find, uh, you know, values in this mm -hmm. kind of situation? I think this is a really good question because my theory of moral realism strongly emphasizes the role of the political leadership. And my theory argues that without the leadership, you cannot achieve anything. So in terms of global situation, by now, I, I doubt we can have a, a global leadership uh, in next uh, 10 years. So within a decade, perhaps uh, we will face the reality, a world without a global leadership. And the uh, US Trump and the uh, American said that 
they think the global leadership is too costly. They don't want to undertake that responsibility. For China, my understanding, most of Chinese, including policymakers, believe we do not have the, that resources to support uh, or provide a global leadership. So the fact the COVID-19 disaster has shown that there's no global leadership help the old, uh, make a, all of countries uh, cooperate each other against the uh, uh, virus. And even WHO cannot play the uh, role of the leadership. So in terms of global issues, I'm really pessimistic about the uh, future. I think in the next decade, for next 10 years, and we have to solve our problems and rely on ourselves, uh, 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 our, uh, every country rather than a, a, a global leadership. Well, without a global leadership, it doesn't mean that there's a no, totally no leadership. There's a regional leadership. For instance, for your EU, they have a joint leadership by Germany and the France, right? So the, that leadership can make a, a cooperation within that region. And some region, like East Asia, we don't have the regional leadership. So this region, regional cooperation becomes uh, very difficult. So come to China and the US, uh, uh, China-Indian relations. I think uh, we have to rely on two national leadership. That means Chinese national leadership and the Indian's national leadership. If there's a two national leadership are wise enough and know how to deal with these problems and they can find the solution to, to change the, uh, uh, reverse the trend, the conflicts between China and India. If these two leaderships are not clever enough, they, they have no capability to solve the problem peacefully, then I don't think that the people, in, the uh, ordinary people can solve the problem. So my argument that what a, a, the leadership, not only at the international global level and the regional level and also national level. So that's a, that is uh, my argument. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, for next question, I invite Ambassador Shivshankar Menon. Thank you, Professor Yen, for that very clear yeah. and very, very interesting presentation about what you foresee as the nature of China-US competition. Uh, I have one question, though, because on both the wealth and the competition for the digital economy. What we actually see happening is a fragmentation of the global economy into regional blocks. And even the digital, digital economy, uh, we're watching a decoupling. Actually, there are two internets today in the world, a Chinese internet, and there's what the US basically, and US corporations seem to control. Uh, now, with that kind of situation, bifurcation, decoupling, regionalization, fragmentation, yeah. uh, are we really talking about competition, global competition between China and the US? Or are we just talking about a little broken up world where there are local quarrels? And uh, can we really talk of China-US global competition at all in that situation? Okay. Well, I think this is a, a very, very uh, serious uh, question because uh, uh, many people still uh, believe and if we have a bipolar world and the digital economy we divided between China and the US. And uh, personally, I think that this will be a, a misunderstanding. And the first, and the, because China has already established uh, Beidou, uh, the uh, system, and the uh, Certainly, China will replace the U.S. GPS. And uh, so then there were, generally speaking, this uh, will be divided into two uh, internets. That's possible. And this is not uh, actually uh, said by myself. And it's uh, predicted by the UN General Secretary, uh, Guterres, last year. He said it's possible we are going to have uh, two internets, one based on the uh, U.S. Uh, GPS the other based on China's uh, Beidou, this puzzle. But we have a two internet systems. It doesn't mean the digital economy will divided in two groups. The digital economy is a very possibly will divided in several groups, like uh, Mr. Menon said. 
And this is not regional. It's not an East Asian develop a, 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 a digital uh, a market and the European digital market and the African digital market. No, this time is not based on region. It's based on a group of country which are not geographically connected with each other. They separated geographically. For instance, and recently, and Germany has already initiated a plan to have a Germany, Japan, India, and uh, Australia, a four country digital, uh, a four country uh, supply chain. So these four countries are not connected with each other, not in the same region, but then he suggests that we can establish a chain group. This chain group actually, that means from my understanding, will become a digital market, a digital economy. This is that. Okay. And then this uh, uh, another uh, uh, plan initiated by the, uh, 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 actually China talking about uh, the possible and the half of this uh, uh, supply chain with Russia, with uh, uh, Pakistan, and with the ASEAN, with the uh, South Korea, because South Korea won't, won't join the Japan's uh, market. So you see, this is, will be another supply chain uh, group. So in the future, it's a very possibly there's a supply chain group of the digital market economy divided by group, but not according to the region. The country come from different regions because this kind of digital economy actually mainly carried out on, on what? On internet. They do not need to carry it out on the uh, uh, land transportation or the, uh, or the sea transportation like that. So I, I fully agree with uh, uh, Mr. Mainland's uh, 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 idea. It's a very possibly we can have a fragmented chain, uh, a digital economy uh, uh, markets. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Yan. Uh, we have actually a very large number of people willing, wishing to ask questions. So with your permission, what I'll do, I'll uh, we'll combine some questions and ask you to respond to them. So I will invite uh, Ambassador Vishnu Prakash, followed by Ambassador Suresh Koel and, and Mr. Granth Banayak to ask the questions and then invite uh, Professor Yan to respond. Uh, Vishnu? Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Professor Yan, I'm afraid uh, I'm also going to ask you a, a tough question. Uh, now, you mentioned in your remarks that China does not want confrontation, ideological confrontation with the US. Uh, the difficulty is that there are increasing number of states, countries in the world who do not believe uh, what China states. Yesterday, our defense minister also said in parliament that there's a gap between what China says and what China does. Uh, I will cite a couple of examples in the South China Sea. For example, you kept on saying that nothing is happening. You militarized it. Uh, COVID-19, it was hidden, but you deny that. And you see, we see what has happened in Galwan. So why, how is it that, or what, uh, again, uh, in the first decade of this century, China's buzzword was that uh, there is a peaceful rise of China. So there is a gap. And how, how do you expect the world to believe what you say? Thank you. OK. OK. And and next, I, uh, I think we'll, we'll combine two other questions. Uh, good, good. Uh, Shwetong then request you to respond. OK. Uh, next, Ambassador Suresh Goel. And keep the question brief, Suresh. Thank you very much, Ashok. My question is going to be very brief. but. It's really motivated by what uh, Professor Yan, uh, you stated, uh, that the present contest between Ch uh, China and the US is really about cyber, cyber superiority. And now I assume the cyber superiority will translate into the global leadership and therefore the ascendance of a new power. My question really is that if cyber power is going to determine who will be the leader, the global leader or the global superpower in future, uh, what explains the development of the military structures in South China Seas, in uh, Western Pacific, etc.? Because uh, if the wars are not going to be territorial, you don't need militaries very important. You need influence in the governments for which cyber warfare is the, uh, the thing to go ahead with. Thank you. 
नेक्स्ट ग्रंथ ग्रंथ विनायक थैंक यू सर फॉर दी ऑपरचुनिटी कैन यू हियर मी यस Yes, sir. Uh, so, thank you, Professor Yan, for the uh, for an intellectual uh, lecture. I just want to ask you one question in this uh, in in this U.S. China competition on the digital security. Where do you see India's role? Uh, do you see it as an emerging uh, uh, role that can uh, that has some important role to play in the uh, in this competition? Uh, that would be my question. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, back to you, Professor Yan. Okay. Uh, actually, I have a f- uh, four questions, and the first question is about the China's uh, peaceful rise. I would say when we say peaceful rise, it means China becoming stronger without going war, right? And so you see, since 1979, it's already 41 years. And China have not involved in any war. Even there's no large military clashes. Like uh, 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 there's a border disputes between China and India, and but then no one regarded that's a war, right? So you see, in the last forty-one uh, uh, years, China is the only major power to not involve the real war. Even Japan sent the troops. To the war in Afghanistan, so uh, that, that's it. I think uh, uh, China will continue the peaceful rise and principle. Second, uh, about uh, ideology, and uh, I think China's uh, uh, policy uh, uh, avoiding metri- uh, ideological confrontation with the U.S. and uh, is uh, uh, real, as actually has achieved some uh, 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 some results. For instance, and the U.S. use the uh, ideology as uh, arguments to persuade and uh, democratic countries, and mainly the Western allies, and to join the U.S. to block Chinese uh, Huawei. Right? That's the basic. Well, it's true. And uh, Australia, Canada, and uh, the uh, the the the, uh, the Japan and the uh, 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 U.K. some country. Joined the U.S., but we must remember, and the American not only talked with these four countries. American talked many, many diplomat uh, uh, Western countries or the so-called democracies, and even New Zealand, a member of the Five Eyes, re- re- rejected American suggestion. And the Australian said, uh, uh, New Zealand said, we do not like China's ideology, but. New Zealand make decision continue to use Huawei's 5G. So, my understanding, American try to initiate the ideological confrontation against China, and he can get some support, but very very limited. And uh, only very few country will support U.S. against China because of ideology. Maybe some country support U.S. for some secular interests. But that's not because of ideology. So I still believe in the China's strategy and the avoiding major confront ideological confrontation against U.S. will work. Second, a third is about the cybersecurity and who can provide the leadership and for the cybersecurity. And my understanding, in next ten years, I don't think we are going to have global leadership. For cyber security, there will be a lot of cyber conflicts and the cyber wars, cyber attacks, the cyber problems. But mainly, it also means there's no global leadership to develop a global norm to govern countries' behavior on the uh, uh, internet. Just like Obama said, and uh, he said, at this moment. And the cyber world is a still primitive world, one, and that there's no international norms. And so, in the future, I will say this is still the uh, in the next ten years, it is possibly still the same. And but it doesn't mean that because the cyber security is the key parts of national security, it means the military becomes meaningless. No, 
Military is still very important because military has already developed new function on what? On protect cybersecurity. And beside protect cybersecurity, the old militaries for every country, all the major countries have to protect the land border and sea water, this, but this is not the parts or the targets uh, more important than their secu uh, 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 cyber security. The last question, what the Indian role can play in the uh, uh, cyber security? And uh, actually, during the competition between China and the US uh, on the issue of uh, cyber security, Indians seem to me and already make decision, side with the US. And uh, at least, and the Indian government officially announced to forbidden Chinese uh, apps, over uh, 200 apps for the national security. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. The Indian government officially said and the forbidden Chinese uh, apps uh, for uh, uh, security. So Indian, that's my view. And it uh, seemed to me it's uh, difficult and for Indian to take a neutral size on the cyber security uh, uh, issue between China and the US. And because at this moment, Indian believe America can provide a uh, cyber security protection for the Indian. And the uh, history will prove whether this uh, uh, judgment is, uh, is uh, correct or, or not. Th thank, thank you, Professor Yan. Uh, now I'll invite uh, uh, Admiral Shekhar Sinha, followed by Ambassador Yogendra Kumar and uh, Dr. Prashant Kaushik. Uh, first, uh, Admiral Shekhar Sinha. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Ashok. <clears throat> and thank you, Professor Yan. It's always very good to hear you. Uh, you know, we, uh, I have uh, understood quite clearly that you are, uh, your belief is that the cyber superiority or the digital superiority will be uh, the war is all about. Um, you know, it's very unquantifiable as far as the cyber war is concerned, because most of the time you don't get to know what kind of apps, what kind of instruments you are using for that, um, and who's winning, who's losing, because nobody takes responsibility. But my point is, if that be so, then why is the Chinese expansion approach in the South China Sea over the rocks, the reefs, and shoals, uh, claiming it to be some very historical uh, sort of claims. Uh, similarly, now in Bhutan, uh, similarly now in uh, some part in Nepal, some part in uh, uh, Indian border. Uh, if you say that, you know, there is no, China has not done any war, I, I would agree with you as far as the definition of war is concerned. Well, you don't have to fight war because you threaten people. You, your ambassadors, your, uh, you know, diplomats have been threatening every country uh, including U.S. Uh, and, you know, only today, yesterday, the U.S. ambassador to China has resigned. And today he has made a statement before leaving Beijing that it was a big cover up in China. And I'm quite disappointed of being here. So I am quite willing to <clears throat> listen, but I want to know that would, would you do you think that people believe China? Do you know that you might become friendless after some time? I mean, that is my very simple point is to what do you what makes you say that it is only uh, digital supremacy that you are warring for but i feel that hardware of warfare is being increased at such a rapid rate that you don't have people to manage thank you okay <laughs> okay can can we get two more questions uh, shwetong before you respond uh okay. yogendra yeah, thank you uh, uh, please you unmute question uh, group, yeah. uh, can you hear me uh can you hear me Okay, yeah, my yeah, question, ahead. my question actually is this, that in terms of the uh, what uh, Professor Yan talked about uh, cyber, uh, you know, contest the cyber world. Now with the technological changes taking place, particularly in the military sphere, isn't there a possibility of this cyber conflict turning into a hot war, particularly because the fact that you have the conflation of uh, conventional and non and, and, and non and conventional nuclear weapons? The, the, the introduction of artificial intelligence uh, in the fighting of war, I mean, to the extent that now the artificial intelligence will be used even taking decisions about war fighting. So the possibility of this kind of a 
war taking place even by accident, I think that's a big issue. And to what extent, how, let's say, a theoretician like Professor Yan, thinking as to what kind of confidence building measures can be developed, that this kind of possible does not arise, because that's a very real possibility. <clears throat> uh, Prashant? Uh, Prashant, will you come in? Hello. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Professor Yen Shethong. So I have two questions. Uh, uh, number two, one is... One, uh, limited to one question, Prashant. Yeah, yeah, so small questions, small questions. Number one is, uh, what are the uh, uh, characteristics of uh, uh, China's perceptions of India? into the a role of digital BRI in this uh, uh, oncoming uh, global uh, digital economy. How does Professor Yan see that? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, back to you, Professor Yan. Okay. Well, uh, I have four questions. And the first one is that if the digital, the cybersecurity is so important, and why China still use a major force to protect uh, these uh, uh, islands and uh, uh, ships uh, in the uh, 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 South China Sea. Well, I think that that's really simple. And just like that, uh, it's not because I'm becomes rich. So I will give up and uh, it's uh, uh, my, uh, un, uh, the poor, uh, poor land. So no matter how rich the country, they will still protect their own territory. So it, I, I don't think that there's uh, any conflict. And then no matter how rich the United States, I don't think United States said, okay, we will give up our territory to others. So just like uh, all, the, uh, all the individuals, and uh, we may become the rich, but it doesn't mean that you will give, you, give up your old house to the others. So these uh, military still useful. I do not deny the military, uh, let's say military becomes useless. Military is still useful, but then you find that the cybersecurity will become more important than these uh, traditional security issues. Second, it's about the, whether the cyber war will uh, bring about the real war. Well, from my understanding, the question is that uh, why there's no direct war between the US and the Soviet Union during the Cold War, and there's uh, only proxy war between them because of the nuclear weapons. And the, since the nuclear weapons uh, can prevent the direct war between Soviet Union and the uh, US, and it will play the same role and play, have the same function to prevent direct war between China and US. For instance, the nuclear weapons do not only prevent the, real, the war between the major powers and even prevent the war between US and North Korea. North Korea has a very uh, preliminary nuclear weapons and the US, Trump administration gave up the idea to launch a war against it. So my understanding that in the future and the nuclear weapon will continue and effectively prevent the nuclear conflicts between China and the US as to es escalating into a real war. So uh, that's my argument. The third question is that, and the China's, what's the China's view about the India? My understanding, and in China, most people believe Indian and uh, 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 your current government has uh, did uh, a major adjustment of uh, Indian tra traditional foreign policy. And uh, non-alignment uh, principle has been already given up and is uh, abandoned. And Indian no longer, and uh, talking about non-alignment, and Indian no longer want to take uh, neutral positions. And the Indian and, uh, have a strong uh, motivation and the two becomes an ally of the uh, US. Maybe a lot of uh, Indian uh, friends tell me, no, 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 that's not true. And the Indian uh, didn't give up. But uh, from Chinese eye, we think that currently the non-alignment non uh, principle is uh, just a kind of a cover of the uh, policy of making alliance in the in India. This is a uh, 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 people's view. Uh, I didn't got the uh, fourth question and uh, the last uh, <laughs> uh, uh, participants with uh, two questions. What's the, the Dis Digital Silk Road. Question? He was inquiring about Digital Silk Road. 
a digital BRI or digital Silk Road? Oh, well, <coughs> uh, I think these are uh, actually the uh, situation and uh, becomes a more complicated. And uh, at this moment, uh, it's uh, difficult to make uh, any prediction about it. But uh, I would say, and uh, the uncertainty will be the basic uh, characteristic for the world we face with. And the uncertainty uh, is, will be we face not only internationally and also domestically. And uh, in many countries facing these uh, uncertainty issues, the relationship between China and the Indian also disturbed by the uncertainty. And uh, that means uh, no one can, at this moment, although everyone said that uh, I'm uh, uh, optimistic about our bilateral relations, but actually no one knows and uh, where our bilateral relations uh, goes. So uncertainty is the general character uh, for uh, today's uh, both domestic and international politics. Thank you. Uh, well, actually, we are running out of time. So very quickly, we'll take a couple of other questions. Uh, Vineet, Vinoy, and Admiral Murli Dharan. Uh, Vineet, would like to ask a question? Uh, can, uh, am I audible? Yeah, you're audible. Please go ahead. OK, so what I would like to ask uh, Professor Ayan is, what is China's viewpoint on uh, Joe Biden's presidency, and if he comes to power, do you think there will be a cooling of rhetoric that has been going on back and forth ever since uh, the Trump administration took power? So, how does China see a Biden administration? Do, will there be a normalization of relationships in the future? Okay, uh, Admiral Muli yeah. uh, Thank you, Ambassador Ashok and Professor Yan. Part of my question you already answered while answering Ambassador Goyal as well as Admiral Suna, but I'll be more direct. Do you think that the armed forces are now going to become more high tech in their weapon systems and in their capabilities rather than the conventional? More so since you mentioned the case of Iran, where you expressed a view that because of the cyber attacks that the nuclear system was damaged. Now, could not that happen to the nuclear arsenal of states, including by now what we talked of and then dismissed the would there be chance of an actual Star Wars happening in the future with the kind of technology coming in? Mm. Thank you. Okay, one more we can uh, take. Uh, uh, Sona Chaudhary. Sona, will you come in? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my question to Professor Yang, Yang Shuetong is that, uh, that how does China, China view the US backed, the Clean Network Initiative, which has been launched recently? Thank you. Uh, back, back to you, Professor, Professor Yan. OK, uh, I got three questions. And the first one is uh, how about uh, 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 Biden's policy towards China. And uh, I would say, and uh, Biden first will continue Trump's uh, principle. Uh, that's an anti-China uh, principle. That means uh, Biden will continue uh, confrontation. Uh, against China, and uh, there uh, uh, will, uh, won't be any difference. But Biden will adopt a different strategy to achieve that goal. Not, he will prefer multilateralism instead of uh, unilateralism. So Trump relies on a very little on his uh, traditional allies. He relies on less uh, collective efforts and the in rivalry or competition with the China. And the Biden will make an adjustment on this perspective. Biden will try to and make some concession to his allies uh, for the purpose, get support from the allies uh, to, uh, to its policy against, uh, uh, against China. So th that means, and uh, you, will you will see, the China will face uh, a different difficulties or pressure from Biden administration and uh, uh, then uh, from the Trump. For instance, and the Trump prefer the trade war. And uh, my understanding, and if Biden came to, to power, he do not like the trade war. He do not think uh, increase the, the uh, customer tax will serve American's interest. 
he will continue have a more trade with China rather than reduce the trade with China. But Trump, Biden will increase more political pressure on political issues like human rights issues on China, and he may initiate some uh, uh, anti-China uh, policy in reform of WHO. So this is very different. And also Biden may be considering cooperation with China on what? On the climate change. And Trump definitely not. And so then, generally speaking, that Biden will continue a tough policy on China, but his strategy different from the uh, uh, Trump. Second question is about the uh, technology, uh, high tech uh, for the military. I think this is a very, uh, very uh, a good question, and based on your uh, sensitive about the uh, change of high tech in military equipment. And nowadays you find that AI is new technology. What mean, mean AI? AI means that more and more military equipment will operate it not by a human being, but by AI. No, this, this kind of uh, technology, uh, technological progress and in the military equipment will make what? Make the attack more exactly, make the casualty becomes smaller. Now, if you look at that, the war in the Af uh, uh, Afghanistan and uh, all in the Iraq and actually caused less casualty than the war in the, uh, 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 the, uh, the other proxy wars during the Cold War. So the more advanced the weapon and the human being developed, actually the, each war, they kill less people. That's a general trend. And so from my understanding, what's the problem? The problem is very, very uh, 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 serious because less penalty that make the policymakers become more brief to launch military attack. Because anyhow, they just attack the facilities. They said, oh, well, we, we attack your facility. Look at that, no casualty. People say, okay, anyhow, just destroy some, some weapons, uh, cannons, uh, buildings, but no people die. Then people will tolerate this kind of war. They say, okay, this is just destroy things, not a destroy, not a, uh, uh, kill people's life, uh, kill people. People are still alive. So generally speaking, the a with AI applied to military equipment, there's a, will be more military attack. Look at the situation in Afghanistan. When U.S. used the, the drone, they launched a more attack than before, than before they used the drone. So I think that this is a very, very good question. And they will make uh, this metro situation uh, uh, different from our current uh, imagination. The last question is about uh, Americans' uh, plan and uh, announced by uh, Pompeo, the clean uh, website. Well, actually, this idea is uh, based on what? Based on Americans' domination. This plan is based on American domination. That means, okay, let's all of the countries and work with the U.S. establish a, a, a information a, a, a align without China. And everyone can join the U.S. but China. Based on what? Based on American domination. That means that then we can guarantee no one steal information from you except the United States. Why you join uh, this plan? because you trust the US. You trust even the US steal your information, you're safe. You do not worry about American steal your information. So this plan is very clear. And from my understanding, this plan possibly uh, become attractive to some country and politically fully trust the US. They don't think the US will use this information, hurt them. But, uh, Certainly, all the members understand that if you join this uh, uh, line, then your information controlled by the, all of the data and information controlled by the United States. But I think a lot of major powers hesitate. They said, wait a minute, we do not want China to collect our uh, information and the data. But then they ask a question, why we allow the US to do it? Why US collect our data and the information is safe? I, I doubt 
most of major powers will trust the U.S. And we have so many cases before, how, how much U.S. uses this data against the individual, against the foreign company, against the foreign CEOs, against the foreign countries. And I don't think and any clever government trusts the U.S., uh, this plan initiated by the United States. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Yan. We still have uh, many questions in the chat box. We have run out of time. In fact, we exceeded the allotted time. Uh, so before we conclude, would you like to make any concluding remarks? Any, any summing up, any concluding remarks? OK. And uh, uh, thank you. first, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Kent, and uh, provide this uh, uh, good opportunity for me to uh, share my ideas with a distinguished Indian friends. And second, I will say that, and we really need two mentalities to look at the current international politics. First, I think we should use the digital mentality to replace geopolitical mentality. I do not mean that there's no geopolitical conflicts. I mean that geopolitical conflicts is going to give up their dominating position to digital uh, problems, uh, digital conflicts. And the second, and we should uh, uh, develop a, a non-Cold War mentality. The Cold War has been, Cold War mentality has been, uh, because Cold War lasted 40 years and many people grown up is through that age, uh, through that period, and were influenced by that uh, history. And no one can avoid influence by the history. And we're so familiar with Cold War, so we always use the Cold War mentality to look at the a new world. Actually, my understanding, we need a, a, new, uh, a new mentality to understand the, uh, the new world. Thank you, thank you thank very you. much for your time. Thank you, thank you very much, Professor Yan. Let me you know on behalf of everyone present here, thank you for uh, that very lucid and clear lecture that you delivered and for answering uh, a whole lot of questions, very diverse questions, not, not always uh, uh, sort of limited in the scope to theme of it today, but your lecture has given us much food for thought and also a number of uh, interesting ideas like digital mentality that we need to explore further. So this is a dialogue we would like to continue. So let me conclude here by thanking Professor Yan and indeed thanking okay. all of you for joining us in this special lecture and in discussions that followed. Thank you very much. All the very best to all of you. Take care and stay safe. Okay, thank you. Thank you all, uh, thank, thanks for all your participation. Thank you. Bye. Yeah.